Our next speaker is going to talk about anti-aging. He's a researcher and a future author on that topic. His first Long Now event was eight years ago. Please welcome out Chris Patil. Suppose I told you I have in my hand a pill that will delay the rate of aging and extend human longevity. You would probably have a few questions. Where did it come from? How do we know it works? Maybe, how can I get some? But more importantly, what are the ramifications? How does the existence of a medication like this change the way we think about the future? Soon a drug like this will be not science fiction, but science fact. We're entering the era of anti-aging medicine. This is a field in which I worked for many years. Today I'd like to tell you about it. Um, the first clinical trial of an anti-aging medication is starting this year. Metformin, a drug that's been used for decades to treat diabetes, is being tested to see if it can reduce the rate of onset of age-related disease. Aging itself isn't recognized as a disease yet, but it's the primary risk factor for a very, very large number of unpleasant conditions, as the graph on the next slide will show. We know a great deal more about the fundamental biology of aging than we did just a few years ago when seminal work at MIT and right here in San Francisco showed us that we can meaningfully study aging in smaller, shorter-lived organisms. This early work showed us that single gene mutations can actually extend longevity in animals, and soon we learned that the same genes that control aging in yeast and worms and flies are conserved in mammals, including human beings. The discovery of conserved anti-aging genes has some very deep implications. First, it means that we can meaningfully study aging in ourselves by studying shorter-lived animals, and this dramatically increases the rate of research progress. Second, and more importantly, it means that aging itself is a process that can be intervened in using drugs, and soon researchers found molecules that can do exactly that. These drugs, of which there are now many known, all work in different ways, as they must, because aging isn't one thing, but many things happening at the same time. And in this sense, the biology of aging is like that old story about the seven blind sages all trying to understand an elephant by only touching one part of it at a time. Fortunately, these drugs all have similar effects on the lifespan curve, which is basically your chance of remaining alive as a function of time in graph form. They all push the curve to the right, which means they extend the health span, which is what we call the healthy part of adult life. And that's a good thing because we want people to be living longer, not just dying longer. But how do we convince the FDA or other regulatory bodies that a given medication is safe and effective? This is especially challenging humans because human beings are terrible experimental animals. We're what a scientist might call poorly controlled. We eat badly and differently. We exercise irregularly or not at all. How do we get human beings to sit still and behave long enough that we can measure the effect of a drug on an 80-year lifespan? The simple answer, of course, is that we don't do it that way. Instead, we look at shorter-term endpoints. In the metformin study I mentioned earlier, the idea is that aging is the primary risk factor for a lot of different diseases. So if a drug delays the onset of many different diseases over a few years, it's probably acting by delaying the underlying rate of aging. An alternative is that we could develop what are called biomarkers, which are cellular and molecular signatures that track along with the rate of chronological aging and allow us to measure aging in real time. You might be ready to go now. You might have heard enough. You might think, well, if the medication is ineffective and I take it, nothing bad happens, probably. But if the me medicine is effective and I wait to take it, I might be robbing myself of years of productive life. Unfortunately, you're out of luck unless you happen to be a dog. There's a multi-center team that's testing another drug called rapamycin to see whether or not it can extend lifespan in dogs the same way we know it does in mice. The early findings have been very, very promising, and assuming funding exists, the team hopes to expand the study to thousands of dogs in the next few years. We're not gonna know whether these medications work in humans for a while yet, but many, many compounds are known to exist and many, many more are on the way. Several companies and research institutions have been founded, some of them very nearby, to develop new medications, test them, and then translate these findings into the clinic. So eventually, we will have an anti-aging pharmacopoeia, and everyone in this room is going to have to ask themselves, 
should I take advantage of it? I'm not talking about 10,000 year lifespans here, but I am talking about a world in which many of us will be around for decades longer than we are now, and will be forced to confront the consequences of our own actions in a way that we aren't necessarily today. So what happens when we all live longer? Do we overpopulate the planet? Or are longer lived people better stewards of the environment? Will societies and institutions benefit from the preservation of knowledge that's currently lost to senescence and death? Extending lifespan has personal, societal, and planetary implications, and I'd submit to you that it's something that those of us with a long-term perspective should start thinking about now.